Oh, welcome everyone to the Ontology Summit 2020. Uh, this th summit's theme is knowledge graphs. And the date is January 29th, 2020. And this is the first main session of the Ontology Summit 2020. So today we're going to be giving an overview. We'll be giving an overview. Things are on here. Yeah. Uh, Somebody is not on mute. I guess, I guess I did it. Sorry about the delay there. So this is the summit overview. Uh, you can all see the slides. So today we're going to be looking first at the theme for the summit, then a brief recap of the fall series. Then uh, we're going to go into the main series, um, give a little, the, uh, little bit about how that series is going to begin. And then uh, organizers from the summit are going to be giving presentations, starting with John and then Ravi, then Gary and Ron. And after they're finished, we're going to, I'm going to give a little bit about logistics and the communique. So the theme is uh, knowledge graphs. And uh, as you can see by the logo, we've divided up the subject into um, eight kind of focus areas um, given by these question words, whence, what, why, how, who, where, and when, when and, wh and whither. So in the theme, actually, uh, the theme as specified on the Ontology Summit 2020 page, it goes through some of these. So whence knowledge graphs, okay, what's the history of those? Well, they're closely related to ontologies and semantic networks and emerged in the last few years. Uh, we'll, uh, John will be talking a little more about that today. Um, then what are they? Well, they're basically structured representations of semantic knowledge uh, stored as a graph, so it's called a knowledge graph. And, uh, but they're lightweight versions of semantic networks. Again, John is going to be saying a little more and Ravi as well. Then why would we bother with these? Well, the idea is that they scale to massive data sets, which are very important today with modern AI and machine learning techniques, as well as the enormous amounts of data that one has on the World Wide Web. Then how, how are they developed and used? Well, industry is certainly devoting a great deal of effort and we hope to get some speakers in the series who will be addressing exactly how this is done. And they turn out to be critical to some of the important virtual assistants that we have today. And who are the ones who are using them? Well, a lot, uh, not just on ontologies, but big data, linked data, artificial intelligence, deep learning, and many others. Now in the fall series, we were, uh, we basically, asked a number of people to speak to give us a kind of idea of what we're dealing with here. And so we had uh, Jans Osman come and give a very nice presentation and it's available on, online. 
uh, why knowledge graphs have hit the hype cycle and what they have in common. Then John gave actually a couple of presentations about knowledge graphs, uh, which he'll be recapping today. And later on, he's going to give uh, additional uh, information about this at a session that I'll mention just in a moment. And then we had a series of three sessions by Elise Stickles, uh, who is at the um, at UBC, British Columbia, uh, talking about metaphor, and in particular, the MetaNet repository for metaphor analysis. So that was back in the fall series. Fall series, of course, also involved a lot of planning sessions. Now, in the main series starting today, we classify the sessions according to these question, okay, the eight question words, but we're putting who, where, and when together as a group and call them the use case uh, classification. So each session will be convened by one of the summit organizers and there will be one speaker. Next week, Chaitanya Baru will be speaking and Ron will say more about this as he is the convener. Uh, February 12th, John will be speaking and he'll tell me us more about this in a moment. Then uh, on the 19th of February, Matthew West is going to be speaking on from data to business value. And uh, I'll convene that and I'll tell you a little more in a, in a moment. And then on 26th of February, uh, Gary is convening a session, Insights from Knowledge Graphs by Adarud Prabhu. Now, Matthew West will be speaking on from data to business value, classified in the why part, the why question, ans answering the question of why. Um, so he's gonna do some questions are gonna be considered shown there. Um, those are just a sample of questions. Then he'll talk about the critical properties of information that are needed and then applying quality management <coughs> information. So we are looking forward to a very nice presentation coming up by these four speakers and it will continue on until mid-June. So now I will give it over to John. John. Okay. Okay, I'll talk about the history of knowledge representation and how it's gone from linear notations and diagrams and relations among them. And uh, uh, starting in the third century AD, uh, the philosopher uh, Porphyry uh, organized his uh, categories in a tree. And that tree is very similar to the same trees that we see every day in all of the ontologies we have today. And actually, He's the one that's given credit for it, but it's quite likely that the uh, uh, diagrams, similar diagrams were used uh, long before, but they just didn't happen to get recorded in the manuscripts that have survived. Then uh, in the uh, late 19th and early 20th century, Peirce developed a graph notation for logic, and uh, this is, follows on to his earlier algebraic notation, which became the foundation for the predicate calculus, the most widely used notation. But in the existential graphs, he represented first order logic, higher order logic, meta language modality, and also relationships to and from ordinary language. In the 1950s, Lucien Tenier, uh, a linguist in France, developed dependency graphs, which have a very direct mapping to and from of the various graph notations, including knowledge graphs and everything else. And they're widely used in computational linguistics because they have such a direct mapping to the graphs. In the 1960s, uh, Margaret Masterman was the first person to introduce the word semantic network in her uh, article. And she had a strong influence on Quillian and Shank and others in uh, the 60s. In the 1970s, various people started bringing in logic into the graphs to represent versions of logic. And I list uh, uh, various people. Uh, and then 1980s, then we had lots of expert systems and database conceptual schema work, the Psych project, and the standards were being proposed for the Shared Reusable Knowledge Base Project, SRKB. All of this is built on everything that went before. 
Now, in the 1990s, that's when the, uh, more statistics started uh, to come into AI. And uh, the neural networks were one of the earliest representations, but they started to get more widely used in the late 80s and 90s, but they still were competing with everything else. The next slide, uh, the next slide shows the, uh, do we have the next slide? On this, hello, hello, 10, next slide, number eight. Okay, yeah, the conceptual schema for databases uh, was uh, being proposed in 1978. Uh, this is the uh, diagram for the ANSI Spark uh, three schema design, and they wanted to di distinguish the uh, external uh, schema, which uh, is represents the user interface, the uh, internal schema, which represents the way data is stored, which could be either a graph notation or an, uh, SQL tables or uh, relations or whatever. And the idea is that the conceptual schema was the ontology that represented the interfaces among the various uh, applications, the databases, the applications, and uh, user interfaces. And all of them, uh, for every or information passed along any of them, the uh, conceptual schema represented the semantics. And for more information about this, including the references to the original uh, uh, publications, uh, there's a, uh, you can check my uh, web page, uh, jfsoa.com, IKL. And IKL has a lot of, over 100 references to the original data, plus uh, some commentary by me. So you can look for that. And uh, slide nine is uh, the uh, DAMO requirements. These were the requirements written by Jim Hendler, who was the project manager for the DAMO project, which uh, became the foundation for the semantic web. And uh, the point is that here is the diagram that he had in the requirement specification. And it showed that the interchange level must support higher order logic, fuzzy logic, and a meld of various representations used in all the applications. <clears throat> and then it also shows SHU as a very simple ontology. And classic is, uh, is a, uh, as a description logic that um, uh, evolved into OWL. And slide 10 is, uh, slide 10 uh, shows the semantic web layer cakes. And the, on the left is the original proposal from Tim uh, Berners-Lee's uh, proposal. And note the point is that um, that supports everything in the requirements document, including this big double arrow, which says the semantic web unifying language. And um, he, uh, Tim called that SWELL, the semantic web logic level. And that was supposed to be the level, interchange level among everything. But uh, as the uh, project continued, the version that was delivered in 2005 is a very drastic uh, simplification of what uh, Tim uh, proposed in 2000. And uh, Tim had hoped to continue this and uh, build up more, but the uh, version of 2005 is really uh, the, what people call the semantic web. Now, there's been more development of uh, notations and such and uh, some more specifications, but the basic semantic web that we have today is really based on the technology of 2005. And one of the big restrictions on it is decidability, which was not a requirement in uh, the original uh, pr uh, specification or in the original proposal, but that decidability is more of a restriction it's not a feature that helps anyone. It's a restriction that limits what can be said. And so then uh, the next slide uh, is a summary of what we have, slide 11, is a summary that goes, to, mentions future challenges and possibilities. And the idea of the knowledge graph is to be more readable than RDF and OWL and uh, the uh, other notations, and also more flexible. And there's 15 years of more technology that has been developed in the, uh, since, the, uh, <clears throat> uh, uh, since the end of the demo project. And people want to have a, a notation that can map to and from the uh, ordinary language, especially things like Siri and so on. And also, they wanted to map to the new technology, such as the uh, neural nets and a wide range of other kinds of interfaces. And the 
ex emphasis is on flexibility and decidability is meaningless. The idea of decidability is to have to prove that something is decidable in polynomial time. But poly, any polynomial with an exponent greater than one just does not scale to the World Wide Web. So decidability just means nothing when you get to uh, huge volumes of data. And uh, some of these uh, knowledge graphs can be mapped to and from RDF, but others are closer to natural languages. And some are used in a wide range of things, including uh, notations that are very similar to the conceptual schema work of uh, the for the databases. And uh, the point that I would like to emphasize is that it's premature to specify a standard for them because there's so much uh, development going off in many different directions that nobody really knows what are what is the ultimate range of possible applications and what are the best foundations for supporting them. So that's my quick oh. summary. Thanks, John. So now we'll move on to Ravi. So Ravi, please join us. Hello. Yes. Can you hear me now? Yes, I hear you. Thank you. Uh, OK. <laughs> um, I went and searched mostly on Google Scholar, Advanced Google, and so on. Uh, continuing from my last uh, few slides on what is a knowledge graph and found that there is no single agreed definition. But we heard uh, one of the speakers, uh, Hans Asman from France Allegograph, who said that it is a system that tries to know and learn everything it can about an entity. Of course, there is behind it a use, purpose, product, or process. Um, and it includes a semantic graph, ontologies, taxonomies, and identities. And the techniques use machine learning, NLP, text classifier, this type of pattern will repeat in many of the definitions of knowledge graphs, although I can't say that everyone will follow this kind of sequence. Uh, we had also one uh, short slide uh, by Todd earlier, which related to uh, databases and uh, graphs of different kind. John Sowa has spoken to us in many forms on how many types of graphs, but knowledge graph term has really picked up in usage after Google introduced it, which is only one particular way of creating knowledge graphs. So the second reference I found is from uh, Nicola, <coughs> road sites. Um, it's a set of data points linked by relations. So almost all people that I refer to, they say you start or you create triples, which link data uh, points. Uh, they are, the, he calls them uh, secondary or derivative data sets. Creating the first knowledge graph is significant, but thereafter you can repeat the process uh, to create a set of knowledge graphs. And it does require domain and machine learning expertise as well as technical infrastructure. So we can see one and two definitions have a lot in common, but they are not exactly the same. Next slide. Uh, this is a, a wonderful, uh, I like it. This is a pictorial representation. I hope we could borrow it for our kind of um, logo type, uh, introductory type of graph. Uh, so here, you know, you can see in the first row a lot of sources of information, text, 
databases, tables, email threads and messages and so on and so forth. You extract something, grind it out of it and create some sort of understanding of what it is that we are focusing on. And then you use create a taxonomy or ontology. Ontology is what most people like to say about knowledge graphs. Then again you turn it and then you come out with something looking like knowledge graph which answers different kinds of questions indicated by this uh, question mark. I really like this uh, better than the one that you will see that I created earlier. 13, uh, slide 14, please. This is another definition. See, Ravi, we really you. have to get moving on these slides. Okay, so Do I have one minute? try to be a little quicker. Okay, well, if we can read. Knowledge graph integrates information into an ontology and applies a reasoner. This is what Julian says. Nicole Murphy and these people reveal a relational machine learning or knowledge graph. They create a good review. They provide semantically structured information. Almost all, always there is semantic information. Please, next slide. I am uh, using Magic Jack and I am calling from India with the limited bandwidth, Janet. So can I speak louder? Does it make better? So it is best if you kindly read, if you can't hear me. This is the last one of my slides. There is only one picture after that. This slide follows um, Pierce's logic. And I know John likes Pierce. This is the last slide. I still think that I stick to my original slide, which was this one in a month or so ago. And that was, we start with the pulse and we reach a result. Well, um, Ken went a bit ahead, but this is the final slide. Thank you. Thank you, Ravi. Uh, Gary? I'm done. Yes. Yes. Can you hear me? The voice was breaking up on my side, but can you hear me okay? Yeah, I hear you fine. Okay, right. Okay, uh, so uh, this particular track was set up by myself and Ahmed Chef. Uh, Ahmed uh, has uh, relocated to University of South Carolina if, uh, from Wright State, if nobody knows, and so he's been a little bit busy. So I've gone ahead and arranged some speakers, and I'm going to be presenting today. But we hope that Ahmed will be able to present in the future. He and some colleagues have written uh, on the history of knowledge graphs. Uh, we thought people would be interested in that, particularly at the beginning. We'll try to work that in and maybe in March. Um, and he has also um, been sponsoring some uh, IEEE um, um, articles on knowledge graphs. So he has a lot to, to say. Hopefully, we'll hear from him in the future. Uh, so I note in my particular slide here that we've had many presentations running up to today. You've heard a little bit about some of them from the fall, for example. Uh, but in uh, July, for example, when we were trying to decide uh, a topic for the year, I was asked to present uh, a case for knowledge graphs. And so uh, the link that you see on the top there is actually my initial slides uh, for justifying uh, this as the topic. I, I will reuse one slide from that particular deck. As you've heard, there's many uh, rationales for why we would do that to enforce semantics, better semantics in our applications, to improve search and so forth, integration of data. And to some degree, that's why I have the Dagwood Bumstead uh, uh, animation or cartoon on the right side, which is the idea that uh, knowledge graphs get used for lots of purposes and because of them, they have lots of different things in there. Uh, you saw a little bit of that in, on Robbie's slide, and I have a slide a little bit like that. The real issue is whether the structures fit together and it, if it all works right and tastes right for us. Um, I note also on this particular slide that, and this was again from our earlier presentation, that formal ontologizing offers uh, 
great degree of help for uh, knowledge graph work. For one thing, it, it improves the expressiveness and the quality of knowledge that goes into a knowledge graph, uh, provides better knowledge organization for the graph, and it provides better support for reasoning. And also we have ontological knowledge engineering practices. Um, I note also that some of these particular ideas have appeared in earlier summits. Last year, for example, when we were talking about explanation, uh, I had, Thorsten Harmon and I had a track uh, on common sense and we had uh, uh, people like Nick Tandon talking about uh, not, uh, common sense in knowledge graphs and the uh, help that gives an explanation. Next slide, please. The next slide uh, that you see now, uh, I thought uh, I would add, throw into the hopper here because at the very beginning of the ontology summits uh, back over 10 years ago, uh, the idea of the ontology or the semantic uh, gradient and spectrum was an interesting organizational idea. If you're not familiar with it, what you have here, and it's a little bit hard to read, of course, uh, lot, lots packed in here, you have a, a hierarchy, a, a spectrum, as it were, going from things that are very informal, have informal and weak semantics, things that you might have in a dictionary or, or maybe in a taxonomy, which is a little bit more organized. And as you move up the spectrum, you get into things that are uh, more semi-formalized, like RDF and so forth, until you reach the top when you have various forms of formal logic and you have descriptive logic in there. And so uh, this provides a little bit of a vision about what uh, we've been working on for a number of years and talking about. And what I wanted to do in this diagram is to say that and show that knowledge graphs are sort of off that spectrum because they combine various parts of the spectrum. And going back to the Dag Dagwood uh, Bumstead uh, cartoon, the idea is that uh, the challenge really is to pick the right things and to harmonize them up and down that spectrum. Uh, and within knowledge graphs, you may have very diverse things that require a lot of harmonization. And again, uh, uh, some of our ontological engineering may help with that very task. Next slide, please. This next slide is a reproduction from um, my original presentation. And it, it is a much more complicated version of the nice diagram that, and the neat diagram that Ravi showed before which is the idea of what's going into a knowledge graph. And so just very simply on the upper level going across from left to right, we have a lot of these ingredients from the informal, relatively informal things like keywords and so forth, things that are in tables, to more uh, structured things and relational databases and RDF and so forth, until the very, and very structured things on, on the right, uh, Freebase and so forth, things that are out on the World Wide Web are coming into it. Um, and you see, of course, all that being integrated into a graph-like form in the middle, but it is important to note that on the, the bottom level, you have the role of domain ontologies to actually improve the quality of all this thing that's getting mashed together inside uh, here. And uh, as it says in the yellow box at the bottom, efforts for communities related to deep learning, knowledge graphs, and natural language processing join their forces in this arena of knowledge graphs in order to develop more effective algorithms and applications. And that is indeed a uh, part of the inspiration for the track. Uh, next slide, I'll introduce the sessions, the two sessions that we're proposing. The session plan, of course, we have this introductory track now. And then as uh, Ken uh, noted before, our first session in February the 26th uh, will be uh, Anarud Prabhu from RPI who presented a very nice uh, a slide presentation uh, called Insights from Knowledge Graphs. So he is going to be presenting that, maybe a little, little adaptation. Uh, the feature of that, and you'll see a little bit more on the next slide, is that we gain this very complicated uh, Dagwood Bumstead type of thing, everything in there. We gain insight into what the Knowledge Graph is and can do from a variety of other things like reason is on it or visual analytics or network science approaches to understand the knowledge graph and to improve it and so forth. I, I note there that Anarud is working under Peter Fox at RPI and working on uh, data modeling, uh, e-science and so data visualization. Our next session will be sometimes in March uh, and uh, that will be, sorry, you've, you've, you jumped, jumped ahead. Uh, at the bottom of uh, this uh, slide 21, Paco Nathan, for, he's a managing partner at Derwin, will provide a talk on the Rich Context Project. Now you can go to the next slide. The last two slides are just to give you a little bit of a picture of what our speakers are going to be presenting. 
And so you can see a little bit of the type of things like web vowel and so forth that Anarut will be talking about, which it provides some visual analytics for knowledge graphs. And my last slide is on Paco Nathan. So uh, this is a little bit more about Paco's work on the Rich Context Projects, which, is, as it says here, intakes metadata from agencies involved with the administrative data to build a knowledge graph of metadata about data usage. And uh, on the right, there are a variety of things he will talk about. He, he's very good at all of these things, and I particularly like his discussion of deep learning and machine learning, which he's an expert on, uh, you applied with knowledge graphs. Okay, that completes my presentation. Thank you, Gary. That was great. So yeah, now, uh, if Ram is on. Can yeah. you hear me? Yes, we hear you. Okay. Yeah, so I am going to kind of present the speakers uh, who are going to talk on a variety of things from whence to why to how to what, whatever, what the, the kinds of things which are presented on the top left hand corner. Uh, our first speaker is uh, Chaitanya Baru, who's going to talk about uh, in, on the whence part of it. Uh, he's the senior science advisor at, uh, in NSF, uh, and he advises NS NSF on this open knowledge network. Now, open knowledge network uh, is, a, I think it's approximately $40 million, or so I'm not sure. Uh, it, there are, it, it is in several phases, and it's part of the National Science Foundation's uh, convergence projects. So if you go to their website, you can find uh, the details about these things. They're called Convergence Accelerators Projects or c Excel projects. And uh, Chaitanya advises on these projects and is particularly on the Open Knowledge Network, which is a track A1, and it's to deal with harnessing the data revolution uh, uh, aspects of uh, NSF's uh, future funding. So he is gonna be presenting on February 5th. Then Ernest Davis, uh, who actually, who some of you might have read his book called Rebooting AI, uh, has been working on common of, on representing common sense knowledge for since his PhD thesis. And the book Rebooting AI actually gives really great insights on the current limitations of these deep neural networks and what are the problems associated and how do you need to augment it and what do you need extra to add to it and things like that. So I, I'm sure that we're gonna get some great insights uh, from Ernest Davis on, 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 on various aspects of the case for knowledge net graphs, or whatever he calls them. Next slide. Uh, then we have several people who are gonna talk about, uh, who did, several of these people who got this uh, open knowledge net, the NSF's open knowledge networks uh, preliminary phase one grants are gonna talk uh, uh, later on. Uh, Jay Pujara is gonna talk on uh, the financial use cases now, some of these dates have not been fixed, and uh, Ken uh, is working with these people to, to fix the dates, uh, depending on availability and things like that. And uh, Jay is a research assistant professor at uh, USC ISI, and uh, his research kind of focuses on knowledge graphs, formalism. I believe it is PhD at University of Maryland with Lisa Getur, who actually gave a talk on probabilistic networks some time ago in our forum, I believe, okay? And uh, he received this NSF OK in phase one proposal, leveraging financial and economic data. And Jay was also given several tutorials at AAAI on knowledge graphs. So he's pretty well versed in this subject. Uh, then we have uh, Chris Mungal in the biomedical domain and is head of the Molecular Ecosystems Biology Group at Lawrence uh, Berkeley Liver National Lab. And I think it's a Livermore, I'm not sure, I think it's a Lawrence Livermore. Uh, Berkeley National Lab, uh, and uh, he also is one of the leaders of the Gene Ontology Consortium, and then he, and the, the Monarch Initiate Q, uh, which actually does phenotype comparison across species using ontologies, like, for example, you want to map between the rat and the human species. There are, there are some ontologies in both the species which are kind of common, and you can map across that thing, and it's very useful. Uh, so again, I, I think uh, a, we're going to get some very interesting aspects of knowledge graphs from here. Then we have uh, Vinay Chowdhury, uh, who actually initiated this uh, uh, this project several years ago when he was in SRI. And the idea is to kind of read biology textbooks, especially Campbell's biology textbook, and the system can answer various queries associated with that. It's a massive project. 
of, inco of encoding the entire knowledge of biology in, a very, in, in essentially using the knowledge graph paradigm. Uh, it was kind of successful to a certain extent, but uh, it was funded by Paul Allen at Microsoft. And then I think later on, uh, that funding was taken out for whatever reasons. Uh, David Gunning was involved in that, and David Gunning moved to DARPA. So that was the end of that uh, graph. But then he's still been working on that. And he got, uh, he's a co-investigator on NSF, OK, and phase one proposals on intelligent textbooks. Now, the idea is that now you take all this knowledge in textbooks and somehow build knowledge graphs out of it. And then you can do uh, intelligent uh, Q&A &A on these textbooks. Uh, in, the, in the world of manufacturing, we have uh, Benil Starley, who also got a Convergence Accelerator Phase 1 grant. Uh, he works at uh, North Carolina State University, and his primary research area is digital manufacturing. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, then uh, we have Iswaran Subramaniam and Spencer Briner, uh, who have been working at NIST on the category theory. And uh, their uh, focus is on representing knowledge graphs using category theory as a paradigm. And now if you look at uh, the ontology spectrum, which Gary Berg kind of showed, uh, there are different kinds of representational formalisms. And the claim here is that category theory actually will uh, uh, encompass all these things and you can represent uh, a whole wide variety of knowledge, both from the engineering uh, pieces of knowledge, like for example, when you say F equals MV, which is a Newtonian loss, to uh, the predicate calculus and those kinds of things can all be represented in category theory. And I believe Ken Bakrasky also is going to talk about it later on. So we have uh, uh, two presentations in this area, I believe. Next slide, please. And there are several speakers whom I have been in touch. Uh, they're potential speakers who uh, have, uh, some of them have agreed, some of them are still talking to them. Olanda Gill, who is the president of AAAI, is kind of busy with her presidential address, which is going to happen in two weeks. And she said she's, she will be willing to give a talk later on uh, in, 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 the, uh, in whatever year, maybe May, June timeframe. Uh, Sargur Srihari, who actually gave a talk on probabilistic networks last year, has not gone, got back to me now. He's, uh, he's in India at this stage. Uh, uh, Guha, I've not gotten a response from him because he said he missed my earlier email and he'll get back to me. Uh, and I think uh, Ken presumably is following up on this thing. Uh, we might be able to find a slot for him because he has really, really, in fact, it would have been great if he, if he was the first speaker, uh, but somehow, I guess my email went into his junk or whatever it is, and so uh, he missed it totally. Uh, then Sean Gordon is going to come back again. Luciella, absolutely no reply from her at the University of San, San Diego. She's in the biomedical domain, but I'm following up on that. Uh, T.N. Butt, uh, Sean Gordon said that uh, he's not the expert on spatial decision support, but he'll have one of his colleagues to talk about it, and that will be again at the later half of this uh, summit. TN Butt has, at NIST has got this interesting uh, project called Rule and Rule Based uh, Technology, where you can actually generate the terminologies and generate knowledge graphs automatically from text. That's the idea here. Like instead of uh, uh, encoding knowledge graphs for, for example, the intelligent textbook, here this one, uh, with this technology, you can automatically generate knowledge graphs, uh, terminologies right now and later knowledge graphs. Uh, I think that's all I have for now. I finished my five minutes. Thanks, Ram. That's really an impressive list of speakers. Now, the um, the communique is going to be um, basically a kind of summary, uh, which we're going to submit to the Journal of Applied Ontology. Uh, the uh, as a result of the need for a communicate. We're going to have two synthesis sessions. Um, I believe the first one is tentatively scheduled for April 1st and the second one in uh, the beginning of June or actually toward the end of May. Uh, but those are still tentative. And then a couple of sessions that are devoted to creating the communique itself. The, um, we will then uh, present the commun uh, communique at the symposium to be held um, tentatively around the middle of June. So for those who have attended previous summits, it's a good deal later. This symposium will be quite a bit later than we've had in the past. So now um, logistics. Our plan is um, maybe not this week, but in later weeks, we're gonna try to keep the presentation to 30 minutes. So we have 30 minutes for discussion. 
And, uh, but on some occasions, if the topic is sufficiently rich, we may schedule uh, with advance notice a one and a half hour session up to one and a half hours. Uh, all the sessions will start just like today at noon Eastern time. And they all have meeting pages already created um, on the Ontolog Forum website. So there's some supplementary slides here that Gary provided. I won't go over them. I don't think Gary is planning to either. What we'll do now is open everything uh, open to uh, general questions. So if you unmute yourself, uh, let's see, do we have anyone's hand up? No one's hand is up. If you wish, wish to ask a question, preferably click on the hand icon on the chat or just start talking. Um, Ken, can I make a point on, um, Bob and asked a question about the grouping of our um, contextual questions. And it, I think, uh, bears explaining that um, when we came up with this structure, we um, particularly wanted to cover the um, whence, why, how, and whither in depth. Um, so we wanted to um, get people who could give a primary focus to each of those separately. Uh, as Ken said in the chat, of course, everybody will be addressing all of the questions to some extent. Um, the what we also want, deliberately wanted to leave, you know, have some preliminary ideas right now in the kickoff and just to sketch uh, some of the landscape of what and then in the synthesis sessions, we will um, collect what we have learned um, and revisit what. Uh, that left the um, who, where, and when, uh, which don't really warrant um, separate sessions focusing on them. So they clump together in sort of a, a realized use case, you know, loosely speaking, um, focus. So that, that's the logic that we used. Thanks, Janet. Any other comments, Janet? No, I'm, I'm thrilled. This is uh, coming together really well. Yeah. Uh, any other discussion going on in the chat? I believe there's also a discussion going on in the Zoom chat. Um, Jack Ray here. Jack, you were involved in that. Uh, I'm struck by the uh, conversation today because it seems to be about 80% concerned with stored program computers and how to apply them to human understanding. And uh, it seems to me that there are some other methods now being demonstrated uh, that use different kinds of hardware and showing thousand fold increases in speed and reduction in energy, et cetera. Uh, so uh, I, I'm wondering whether uh, we shouldn't have some material on the notion of knowledge graphs simply as facilitation of human communication rather than going into computer -y stuff immediately. Thank you. Thanks, Jack. Um, let me see, anyone else in the... Kenneth? So Todd, you had some comments? Well, I'm just, con uh, I, I'm a little confused. Uh, J I'm not sure what Jack has in mind when he think, talks about non what was it something storage computers what sort of um technologies or capabilities did he do you have in mind jack when you make that reference well in the in the chat uh, column i've given you a couple of urls or, or contacts one is a company that's now in its third year uh, and is out public called pattern computer in which we find relationships that no human being had ever perceived. Uh, for example, in uh, breast cancer, we have found many 
a very significant relationships that the whole oncology community had never even thought of. Uh, and that, by the way, is a software implementation on stored program computers. Uh, but secondly, I've referred you to a, a little uh, a natural semi.com, which is a, a seven layer chip that uh, it reflects a patent of, uh, of Kurt Harris uh, that does not use any stored program, any storage for analyzing a milieu of data and finding all of the possible relationships between each entity in that milieu. And uh, that is uh, that we already can see that thousand fold reduction in runtime and wattage uh, is uh, entirely possible. And in fact, the wattage is the big problem right now in in knowledge graphs with stored program computers. Um, keeping, well, the, keeping the computers cool is a major expense. So Jack, in these other uh, mechanisms, they are not persisting the knowledge in some fashion, some representation? I'm sorry, I didn't understand. Well, it, it somehow in these other, these other mechanisms that you do, are they persisting that knowledge in some fashion? Or I don't understand. Somehow the notion of persist, uh, the notion of knowledge necessarily entails some ability to persist it. Uh, uh, yes, but it also entails the, the ability to recognize when it's no longer valid. Yeah, but. All right, so. Uh, well, I guess the, the point I'm, or the confusion I have is you talk about the stored program mechanisms. Um, and, well, I guess I, I'm, not, I'm ignorant of these other types of, of tools or machines that you're making reference to. And I'm just trying to learn as, as much as I can from you. I'm being lazy here. John, well, John chips, might have some comments about this. These chips. Are you still online? Same. These chips use the same operands as OWL or RDO. It's just that they have a better way of, of discovering all the different kinds of, kinds of relationships among those, uh, those entities. Oh. OK. Um, also, I, I copied one of your Zoom chats into the SoapHub chat. Uh, are there other URLs that you could point us to? And if so, would you put those in the soap hub chat, not the Zoom chat? Uh, I can put them over there, I think, or Janet certainly can. Okay, thank you. Thank you for your interest. Okay, we have uh, Ravi as his hand up. Yeah, I just put a question in the chat because my sound may not come, but essentially the idea is, are we going to see someone create a knowledge graph from uh, data points and relationships or from NLP entities during the meetings? Well, we've had demonstrations. Uh, you know, Jan's Osman did uh, did give a demonstration. I would hope that we would see some demonstrations at some sessions. Uh, Good. But um, it is a big subject, and uh, you know, with only thirty-minute talks, I imagine people might not have enough time to to go you know to that level of detail but we'll see we'll see what we can get yeah i'm hoping somebody will say this is how we construct it and show some steps uh, like the graph that one saw today yes i hope so um john has his hand up 
John, can you unmute yourself? Star six. Um, I would unmute him, but I don't know what his telephone number is. All I see is a telephone number for John. How about the 914 number? Um, is that the area code for? Hello? Ah, ah you got yes, it. Okay. Good. Yeah. Okay. The basic point is that uh, uh, it doesn't matter what kind of computer anybody generates or what kind of software anybody uses or hardware or whatever, we're still going to talk about it in ordinary language. And so the fact is that it'll still come in and out of, through our telephones and our uh, uh, our cell phones and our, our, our good old fashioned computers. So the point is that you can invent all kinds of new technology for discovering uh, new kinds of relations, but as soon as you discover a new kind of relation, you give it a name and then you can talk about it in an ordinary language. Now, one of the things that's very important are the uh, mental models which uh, reflect the kind of uh, scenes and pictures and sounds that we uh, uh, experience. And those are the things that are really the primitives for all of the, our ways of thinking. They're more fundamental than language. They precede language by uh, at least a year or, an, or two in uh, infancy. And, those, uh, and they're with us throughout our lives. The, the uh, experiences in our mental models, those are our fundamental ways of experiencing the world. And then those things can be given names and uh, map to ordinary language. So we're still going to use that in everything we say. And no matter what anybody invents, uh, if they create new kinds of discoveries and new kinds of relations, we just give them a name. That's what happened with quantum mechanics, for example, and the Big Bang and all kinds of things out in the universe. Uh, they were discovered through mathematical methods that aren't explainable in ordinary language in any simple way. But the point is that as soon as anybody discovers it, they give it a name and then they can start talking about it. So that's what we'll still be using. No matter how long people will survive, uh, they'll be using ordinary language. But what the name uh, implies to two different human beings can be well, quite different. That's, uh, that's true of every word we use. No two people have exactly the same meanings for any uh, for any word. But the point is that we always can ask a question. That's why you always need a follow-up question. Uh, and just a, a system that just gives you one answer is not adequate. What you always need is to say, what do you mean? Uh, is this an example of what you mean? Can you give me an example? Can you explain it? So we always need to be able to have follow-up questions. And uh, what happens is through a dialogue, we collaborate uh, the terminology we use. So uh, a standard, an official standard uh, for anything is uh, something that's necessary for if you're going to write a program. But when you communicate with another person or with a computer, you're always going to be communicating in terms of your own language. And the other uh, person or computer you're talking to will not be exactly in sync. And so you have to have a dialogue. And the dialogue is what synchronizes uh, your meanings. Excellent. So where is the topic dialogue in this interchange? The topic dialogue is yeah, whatever you create. Yeah, we talk about RDF and OWL and all this crap. No, no, no. Well, the, the topic dialogue is whatever dialogue. you create in your, in your dialogue. So like you and I started with different meanings. We, caught, we had a, a disc, uh, some sort of interchange in which we uh, adjusted each other's uh, terminology so that we could communicate. That's Did the way you're going to compute. Did we conduct a dialogue? Well, you've been talking and I've been talking and we've both all been, we've both been listening to the, what's been going on. So throughout this situation, a lot of people have been talking and listening and writing and, and reading. And uh, through this uh, communication, uh, we've adjusted the way we're talking and what we're saying in order to communicate. That happens all the time. Well, I agree, and I, and I, I think we've had a little dialogue because I've learned a lot about where your what your your viewpoint on this, and I respect it. 
And my question is, where, where is the topic dialogue in this communique? Uh, Jack, uh, it isn't that's about something this we'll have already to add, have. Yeah, we'll have to Jack, add that. Yeah, I, I think, yes, we can add it. And I think we should um, keep that in mind for maybe next year, um, maybe getting broader and deeper on the question of language and you know, the dynamic development of representations and um, you know, as you're saying, uh, persistence has uh, positive and negative uh, aspects that um, here at the INCOSI IW, the International Council on Systems Engineering International Workshop, which um, I'm still attending, uh, we had some discussion on patterns and patterning, the process of patterning and in terms of Percy and um, understanding of language and moving from the indexical to the iconic to the symbolic. Um, and I think it, it would be interesting to maybe get into depth later. I, I really like the um, setup that we have here for this summit, but I, I think those are uh, good points you're making. Uh, to reinforce John's point, I would like to report that we found out a few years ago that when starting to design a new uh, system, uh, the best way to do it was to draw cartoons on the wall. No text whatsoever. And so the set of cartoons were intended to communicate what the system was supposed to accomplish. Right. And, and that's, that that's that when we do that, the project went way, way faster and people that's, understood each other way better than arguing over terminology. Yeah, that's that, well, a that's, really good point because that's the indexical level of language. Uh, I'm sorry, the iconic level of language um, or indexical, but it's not the symbolic. The symbolic is where you start getting uh, lost in the um, representations. Well, that's an interesting uh, point about cartoons that uh, Wittgenstein uh, uh, said in one of his comments that you could write an entire textbook on logic consisting of nothing but jokes. And uh, basically that's true, that the jokes are the things that lead you to a new conception that um, wasn't in your pattern of thinking before and it breaks that pattern to create new patterns and basically a sequence of, of jokes is a good way to present your philosophy. Excellent. Uh, there has been a discussion on the chat room with Mike Bennett and some others. Mike, are you still there? Uh, yeah, I'm here, yeah. And I was just clipping and here and there. Um, so I commented earlier that I really liked the early Tim Berners-Lee stack that I've never seen before that show different <coughs> levels of logic, the first order and higher order and so on, because uh, it worries me that in some circles, this idea is getting pre prevalent that to be an ontology is to be first order and to be owl and, you know, to be decidable and so on. And that is, of course, a very useful artifact, but understanding how meaning works and uh, in order to be able to document more things about the business problem domain, you do need to be able to talk about those higher orders of things, which actually kind of brings me along to my uh, comment just now, um, on the back of John stuff, which is, you know, you, you're describing the later Wittgenstein language games and so on. And of course, in our understanding of how language works, that supersedes the whole Russell and Whitehead type of stuff of being able to do it all in logic. But for useful applications that you can put in knowledge graphs and do something computational with, we're kind of still with Russell and Whitehead. And that's not necessarily a bad thing, as long as we understand that is not how meaning really works in the same way that Dr. Johnson's dictionary is not how language really works, but became a useful artifact for helping us lock things down. Yes, that's important. And the, uh, But the point is that, uh, to get back to Wittgenstein's language games, every language could be expressed, every language game could be expressed in first order logic. The problem though, is that you have to be able to switch from one game to another. Sometimes you might even refer to two or three different language games within a single sentence. And that means that you need to have a meta level that you use to relate 
all the different uh, object levels. So you can still represent your object level in first order logic and map that in to and from your computer program, but then you need to jump up to the meta level where you then talk about how these different object level versions relate to one another mm -hmm. and to the real world. That's a really valuable point. And it, to me, there's a parallel there between that and having different application data models, including different application owl ontologies for different use cases where you extract from the sum of knowledge that there is just what you need for that application to solve that particular problem. And so perhaps we can think about you know, the ecosystem of applications within an organization as being like those language games. Yes, and that's important also for uh, any kind of an implementation. And uh, the thing is that uh, we're never going to be able to implement all of them simultaneously, but we need to have some way of moving from one to another. And that's why I think that ordinary language and uh, just a typical dictionary uh, that you can pull off your shelf is far more valuable for relating multiple uh, language games because it re represents the sum total of everything that that uh, lexicographer happened to come across or that uh, family of lexicographers happened to come across in analyzing a huge corpus of data. So that the dictionaries represent your common average usage and that's a useful starting point for moving to any particular detailed usage. Yeah, agreed. Okay, we've, uh, we've run out of time. So um, I will uh, now adjourn the meeting, and I hope all of you will come to uh, the um, all of the sessions. So we hope to get a lot of a lot of discussions like the one we have today. And uh, so see you all next week. <laughs>